Hi, cybersecurity class. It's Professor Opterbeck. And in this video, I want to circle back to some things that we began to look at a couple of weeks ago as we're now moving into a part of the class where we're looking at digital evidence. And this week, we're looking at some materials on how, what digital, digital evidence is and as a practical matter, how it's collected. I also wanted to just kind of close the loop and talk about some of the authorities under US law through which the government might collect digital evidence from citizens. And we'll look at all of this stuff this week. And then as we move into the following weeks, we're gonna to start to talk about compliance of uh, private organizations of a corporation or some other enterprise. Now, one piece of compliance is going to be responding to requests from the US government. And any um, entity that is collect that has digital information, certainly entities of any size, like or lar very large ones like a Facebook or Google, is having to respond to government requests all the time. So, you know, part of the job of a lawyer or of a compliance officer is to evaluate these requests and um, and these court orders and warrants and other things and to make decisions about what is actually um, required and to develop policies for um, when the organization will simply comply with those things and, and whether or when the organization might resist some of those things. So we'll, we'll look at some of that this week and then as we move into future weeks we'll start to talk about the cybersecurity interests and the privacy obligations of the enterprise. Uh, both for its own protection and as to the uh, the personally identifiable information the organization might hold. And by the end, what I want you to see is kind of an overall picture. We have these civil rights concerns, and certainly simply as individuals, we have these civil rights concerns. Possibly as a lawyer representing individuals in criminal matters, you, you might be dealing direct directly with those concerns. But also as a lawyer or a compliance officer, in a private enterprise, you're going to have to respond to government requests, and you're also going to have to, to protect your own cybersecurity for your own reasons and um, deal with regulatory and other pieces of potential liability. All right, so we already looked at this overall graphic showing the Fourth Amendment uh, obligations and the case law as it developed in the Fourth Amendment context, and we noted a few uh, statutory issues uh, that Congress interacts with the Fourth Amendment on a regular basis. So, you know, we said in Olmstead when the court said a wiretap um, was something the government could do without a warrant, the federal government acted uh, in the Federal Communications Act back in 1934. Um, changed some of that in 1968, and then the present wiretap statute in 1986. And we also noted then that the um, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which includes the Wiretap Act, as well as the Stored Communications Act, and the current version of the uh, pen register statute is all there. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what some of those things mean in a minute. Uh, we also noted the Patriot Act, and we've already talked in some depth about the Patriot Act, so we're not going to go, go back and revisit that. Um, I mentioned in that prior lecture, CALEA, so I'll talk a little bit more about CALEA, and, and uh, we also talked a bit about the going dark debate. Uh, again, we won't revisit that in detail here, but we're going to just kind of mention that. Um, and I noted in that prior lecture that even as to a search warrant, uh, federal uh, Rule of Criminal Procedure 41 has undergone some interesting uh, changes that uh, relate to the scope of a search warrant. So we want to talk about those as well. And this first thing that I do want to talk about is the search warrant requirement. Okay, so the Fourth Amendment tells us that a search warrant is a uh, can be issued for papers and effects in a suspect's possession. We already looked in Carpenter um, about whether a search warrant is needed for cell site location information that is in the possession of a telecommunications provider. And we see that the court said, yes, a warrant would be required. We haven't really talked about the what a warrant requires. What, what do you need? What does the government need to show a court 
in order to obtain a search warrant. And the basic standard is probable cause. And probable cause means, as the court has interpreted that, probable cause that a crime has been committed or is about to be committed. Um, so, you know, this is a, um, you know, a, a significant showing the government has to make, but notice it's not a super high bar. I mean, it's, it's not, the government does have to provide evidence to a court and through a witness or, uh, or through affidavits or declarations has to have somebody swear to the fact that there is this and, and that there's probable cause that relates to some specific criminal statute. So the warrant will identify some statute. And of course, it doesn't mean that uh, the individual who is subject to the warrant has necessarily committed a crime. The individual might not even be uh, the suspect in the crime, but might simply have evidence relating to the crime. It doesn't necessarily mean the government has to prove, certainly doesn't have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt or anything like that, that a crime actually has occurred, simply that there's probable cause uh, to believe that a crime may have been committed. All right, um, now, so we have the basic requirement of the warrant. I wanted to show you some uh, relatively recent changes, um, you know, over the past 20 years and some more recent than that, to Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 41, which specifies the scope of a warrant. So the warrant requirement is includes that there's, there's probable cause. It also relates to uh, the extent of the warrant. So a warrant has to have reasonable specificity, right? You can't have just a general open-ended warrant. And what does that mean for electronic information? So the first change in Rule 41 that we see is that the warrant can authorize the seizure, seizure of electronic storage media. Um, and in particular, that the warrant authorizes later review of that uh, media. So what does that mean? Well, you know, a in a traditional search warrant, you're uh, you know you're seizing some documents or papers. So I've got a warrant for for documents, and you know I get this folder right of documents, uh, and so then the government has possession of that, and it's expected that the government's then going to go ahead and look into that folder of documents and um, you know decide to what extent that information in fact relates to the evidence of, of the probable cause. Um, and then the, the subject of that warrant, you know, has certain rights at a certain point in time to ask for that information back, right? The government doesn't hold it forever. The issue that arose um, it, with electronic media is, well, you're seizing a hard drive, for example. Um, I believe I have, yeah, here is a, um, you know, a little uh, a hard drive. Uh, and so the government seizes this hard drive, right? Um, now there's going to be a lot more information potentially on this one drive. This one's actually a terabyte um, than there would be in this folder, right? Uh, and so there's a scope and issue, but then the government has to, you know, plug this thing in somewhere. And, and the materials I gave you on the process for that and some of the other videos I gave you, we'll talk about you know, what, what should be done, the government should put in a write blocker, um, you might make a clone of, of this device, and so on. Uh, and then there are tools for trying to recover the information that, that is on that device. Um, but you have this whole drive in the government's possession, and there were disputes about how long could the government hold that whole device, and the government was saying, well, it's a little different than looking at, you know, this folder, we've got to do some forensic things, and so on. So. The rule was amended to allow the government to, to in fact, hold the device uh, for a longer period of time uh, for later review. Um, now, you might think, okay, that doesn't sound that controversial, but um, it still comes up in, in cases uh, where, you know, criminal uh, suspects or otherwise subjects of a warrant will say, well, you, you took this whole terabyte drive. There's lots of other stuff on there that might not relate at all to, to what you're suggesting is probable cause. And, you know, meanwhile, you've got this thing, I don't have access to it. And meanwhile, by the way, you're able to sort of fish around in this bigger drive. And there are cases where defendants try to get a drive back or to get the get narrowed or, or have a, a specified time in which the government can look at it and so on. 
All right, so that that part of Rule 41, I don't, you know, I, as I said, there are disputes that arise. Um, it was not as controversial as this part, these amendments to Rule 41 in 2016, and you can see these are more uh, recent amendments. And what they relate to is NITS, Network Investigative Tool, or RATS, Remote Access Tools. And uh, what this amendment says is that a magistrate judge, and you know, a search warrant at the federal level, by the way, ordinarily goes to a magistrate judge, uh, not the district court judge. And, and what's the difference if, if you don't have familiarity with the federal system? You know, the district court judge is the Article III judge who is you know, appointed with the advice and, and consent of the Senate and, and basically has a, a, a lifetime appoint, appointment. The magistrate system, the magistrate is not an Article III judge. The magistrate system is set up by statute, and the magistrates primarily are handling pretrial matters, discovery matters in civil cases, and search warrants in criminal cases. We'll also handle arraignments and other things. Now, there are procedures in which you can um, give, in a civil case, give to a magistrate authority to decide some broader things if the parties agree. But a magistrate is not an Article III judge, and we're going to come back to that. But magistrates handle search warrants. So the magistrate has the authority uh, within a district to issue a warrant to use remote access uh, under certain circumstances. Now, why does this matter? Well, ordinarily, a search warrant issues in the district where the search is likely you know, is, is going to occur. So, you know, if the government wants these physical documents, uh, then, and I'm here in New Jersey, you know, then the government goes to the District of New Jersey and has a magistrate there issue the warrant. And then the, uh, you know, the federal marshals or the FBI here in the District of New Jersey will execute on that warrant. You know, why does that matter? Well, there is a sense in which uh, keeping things more local provides more accountability. Um, so now I, as the subject of this warrant, you know, if I have to take issue with it, um, I, you know, can, and they, you know, they seize these documents from me and I allege that that was improper in some way, you know, it's, it's uh, easier for me, the idea is to go to the District of New Jersey, local where I am, and there's some local accountability, the local uh, bar is involved, uh, and, and so on. Um, so uh, now you might ask, okay, in an electronic age, is that really true? I mean, it's certainly a different, uh, different country in terms of national versus local than it was in the 18th century, right? Um, but, but here the idea is the government can get electronic tools and, and the government uses this authority to um, use malware, right? Um, to get into a uh, computer system uh, and to collect information uh, effectively using malware. And that can be you know, a warrant issued, say, in the District of New Jersey that allows the government to use malware. Um, you know, that might even be effective throughout the country. And that's been very, um, very controversial. Th this came about um, because the government used a, uh, a NIT to get access to the, the um, computer systems of an ISP that was used widely by uh, a child pornography ring. Uh, and there were, you know, um, motions to uh, quash the evidence and so on as a result of that. And, it, and because of the court dispute that arose and it kind of came to light, the government was using these tools, um, the rule was amended. Now, you know, uh, a big part of the defense bar didn't like this amendment to the rule and some civil liberties groups didn't like this amendment to the rule. And it was, it was one of the interesting pieces about it is how an, how an amendment to the rules comes about. Um, it is not through a statute. So it's not that you, know, you have to get both the House and the Senate to agree on this and then the president to sign it. There's actually a rules committee um, that proposes amendments to the rule. And if there's no objection, within Congress within a certain period of time uh, and the Supreme Court approves it, then it becomes part of the rule. Um, so it's a somewhat opaque process, uh, which is just another part of this dynamic, but in any event, this one uh, got through. All right. Um, 
By the way, uh, I have here, you know, does this conflict with the Federal Magistrates Act? There is some litigation right now about uh, the use of nits and rats, and um, you know, we don't, we won't get into it in detail right now. But the Federal Magistrates Act, again, not Article Three judges, but authorizes this uh, somewhat unique office to operate within jurisdictional bounds, right? So a um, a magistrate sitting in the District of New Jersey has a, uh, has a certain amount of authority within the District of New Jersey, and the, that authority is going to be limited outside the District of New Jersey. And there's some litigation about whether, in fact, this uh, rule conflicts with the jurisdictional limitations on a magistrate, and that will be interesting to watch. All right, 2006, there were amendments relating to two tracking devices. And what I just want to point out um, with this is that the statute specifies the period of time in which a tracking device warrant uh, is good. And a you know, tracking device warrant can authorize you know, putting a GPS device on a car um, or some other kind of personal tracking device. Um, and um, you know limits the time period in which the device has to be installed and how long it can be installed without being renewed. So you know another aspect of the warrant requirement is, is going to be is there probable cause, but it's also going to be the geographic scope, right, of the warrant, the scope of documents to be seized, the specificity. We can be much more specific about a folder perhaps than a, than a hard drive. Um, and then also the time period if it relates to uh, electronic information like tracking information and the rules have information about that. Um, the uh, amendment on the tracking device also uh, has information about the uh, how quickly the warrant has to be returned. In other words, um, um, how quickly the, the tracking device has to be installed and for how long the tracking device um, can remain, and again, if um, the tracking device is going to go on longer, having to go back to the court to get that extended.